Welcome back to In Your Shoes. I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. To create a design-driven company, you need a leadership team that wants to co-create, envision, and shape the future with you. My guest today is a leader who profoundly understands the meaning of human-centered design and innovation. As the Chief Marketing Officer of PepsiCo, she's helping to shape the PepsiCo portfolio of tomorrow. Before joining PepsiCo, she served as the lead CMO of Mars, where she was a driving force in transforming the company's consumer functions. While there, she led and launched Mars Innovation Mandate that put sustainable growth, people, data, creativity, a purpose at its heart. In this episode, we'll talk about her journey to PepsiCo, her vision for the future, and how marketing and design work together to inspire positive change for people and our planet. Jane Wakely, welcome to In Your Shoes. Thanks, Mauro. Fantastic to be with you. Although I wish I was with you in New York. It looks looks amazing over there. Hopefully soon. You're in London right now, right? I'm in London today, right? Yeah. In the in one of the PepsiCo offices or I'm actually else? in Black Swan Data office today, oh, so uh, nice. in Waterloo. You joined PepsiCo recently mm-hmm. as uh, the global CMO of the company, and and you had a similar role in Mars in another multinational corporation before. Uh, there are many people listening to us today that are at the beginning of their professional journey, and and they're probably wondering how can I get where Jane is today. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit of your journey? How did you get where you are today? Oh, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, so if I go back to school, I guess, um, you know, when I was graduating and deciding what to do for university, I have to admit, I didn't want to specialize. I didn't know. Life seemed so full of opportunities. I liked so many things. I wasn't ready to commit to deep dive on one subject alone, which is part of the reason I chose to study business. And actually, in studying business, it gave me these wonderful opportunities to explore completely new topics to me that I'd never had the experience of. So things like psychology, sociology, organizational design, operations management, and design thinking. And it was all so new and exciting. And it also gave me lots of opportunity to work with others. So I did two internships which again was a way of, I think, stimulating my curiosity about the world. I did my first internship for Unilever. It was wonderful. I was in the center of London, um, just behind Oxford Street, working for what was then called Alida Gibbs, which was the health and beauty care arm of Unilever. And I learned all about branding and marketing and the role of design and innovation. But I spent a lot of time doing competitive analysis um, and at that time, there was a certain company called Procter & Gamble who were outperforming Unilever. So for my second internship, I actually went to Procter & Gamble. And because I wanted to keep my experience of the world broad, I, I chose to uh, work in the finance department there. So I had a very different experience. So that really set up my undergraduate experience, which gave me a little taster of different factors of the business world. And, and what I knew I loved from there was I loved working um, on real life problems, on, on problem solving, on coming up with initiatives where you could really see the impact in market. So I chose to join PNG as a graduate and uh, over time um, worked in all sorts of categories from beauty care through to healthcare, and um, ended up in global roles where I discovered, discovered my love of global roles. And, and I did a lot of work in Japan, in the US, and I just really enjoyed the experience of, of working cross-culturally. So then I, then I joined, sorry, uh, sorry, Mara, to interrupt you. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I told you were finished. Go ahead. No, no, it goes on and on. (laughs) Maybe I need to be a bit bit more concise in my answer, but I then joined Mars and, and honestly, you know, how did I get here? It's a very good question. I had 20 years of wonderful experience working for Mars Inc. I started in their uh, food division and then I was in confectionery working on brands like M&M's, Snickers. Um, I've worked in different routes to market from grocery to impulse to D2C uh, to e And in the last six years, I, I, I worked in the pet care division. And the pet care division is very special at Mars because it covers not only pet nutrition, but veterinary health services, digital services. And actually, I got to see a completely different ecosystem and route to market and go to market strategy and experience uh, growth in in a new way, connecting, I suppose, a pet parent's needs fundamentally with products and services, 
which didn't even exist in the category a few years ago. So that was super energizing. And what led me to PepsiCo was I fell in love, honestly, with the pet positive vision, the impact that PepsiCo is committed to making in the world on sustainability, on diversity and inclusion. And our opportunity, and Mara, you're my key partner in this, as designers, as innovators, as marketeers, to connect that purpose um, with creative storytelling, creative um, ideas through our brands to create consumer movements and uh, uh, really make an impact with the billions of consumers we serve every day. So I couldn't resist, honestly. <laughs> So already this short answer inspired at least five different questions that I want to <laughs> ask you. The first one is you mentioned at a certain point in your journey, you felt in love with a global role, the idea of working in global roles. What kind of challenges you face when you work in a global kind of yeah. role and how you balance global uh, and a global strategy, a global approach to branding and business with local, with what is relevant to people in different regions of the world, in different parts of our uh, uh, society? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to answer it in two parts. So firstly, why did I fall in love with global roles? And I always say to, to leaders that are first entering the global world, you're never in the mushy middle on global roles. You're either someone who loves them and thrives or you hate them. There's no in between. <laughs> and I'm one of those people that have, have really uh, um, loved global roles. And one of the reasons is the great diversity that you get to experience. I've learned so much from other cultures, from other businesses. And I think one of the opportunities in global roles is, is just the explosion of diverse experiences that you get. But one of the secrets of being successful in global roles is there is no such thing as a global consumer. There is no such thing in a way as a global solution. It's about finding where scale or connectivity can bring local competitive advantage, can bring local value. And so one of the things that I think my early education helped me with is actually there are lots of things, of course, which are different across the world. But if you can connect with a a simple human truth, a universal truth, something that crosses generations, that crosses cultures. That's where opportunity comes to create ideas or creative platforms that really do scale. Um, so that's how I think about global roles. It's understanding where can you add the most value? Where can you add the most competitive advantage to your local teams, which of course is a key battleground for winning with the consumer and winning with the customer. And how do you get to that common human truth? How do you understand what is that common human truth? What kind of tools and, 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 and how much is tools and platforms and ways of working and how much is intuition, is sensitivity, is empathy? Uh, I think you've formula. just given the perfect answer. <laughs> <laughs> because look, I fundamentally believe in the science and art of marketing or of innovating. I think there are certain principles of growth, certain rules of growth that you need to master. Um, you need to understand what are the key levers for growth. But that combines with a deep sense of empathy and a deep sense of intuition on some things. And it's that beautiful combination, combination of science and art that lifts from something being good to something potentially being great. And I think creativity is a magnifier. It's a magnifier of impact. Um, in terms of growth, it's a magnifier in terms of impact on some of the world's toughest problems that we're trying to solve with innovation, such as climate and diversity. But it's also a great impact um, uh, magnifier of talent. And what creativity brings is it, is it means the best people fight to work on your business, on your business problem. And when you have the best people working on your business problem, no process can um, substitute for that. Really, creativity is about bringing that diverse talent, getting that talent really focused on the, the job to be done. Well, I, I believe in this so much, you know, <laughs> you know this very well. Yes. Uh, in, in the past years, I've been thinking a lot about how to nurture intuition, how to teach empathy, how to grow creativity in organizations. I, I've been wondering and questioning, can you teach mm. empathy? 
Can you inspire intuition? Can you grow from a certain level to a, another level? Uh, what's your point of view in this? Because this is so important uh, mm. in organizations, but because it's so intangible, it's so qualitative, it's so difficult to say, okay, this person uh, at, at intuition level is a three and this other one is a five. And How do you identify intuition and creativity and empathy? How do you nurture them, mentor them, grow them in an organization? By the way, it's, it's probably the most difficult question in the world, but yeah. <laughs> what's your that, point? That is this? a killer question, and I'm honestly reflecting on it. Um, I think like most things in life, of course, there are different levels of talent. And there are some people, the minute you meet them, you know, They have great empathy. They're able to listen. They're able to put themselves in others' shoes <laughs> in the theme <laughs> of the podcast. Um, so talent, of course, does play a role. And I think if you've got some talent or some intuition on this, um, any sort of capability build, um, I think if you're building on a strength, it's magnified. It's, you know, I, I remember reading this amazing study which said it, it was about speed reading and they taught two groups um, how to speed read. One group could already read quite quickly. Um, the other group were average readers. Now, the, the, the group that could read quickly flourished under the speed reading and you know, broke all the records. The other group improved, but nowhere near to the level. So I think, look, if you've got a, a, a general intuition, a general talent, that can be magnified. But having said that, I thoroughly believe in Malcolm Gladwell's point that you need 10,000 hours of experience to be world-class at anything. So no talent, unnurtured, unstretched, develops into a world-class ability. And so I think it is a mixture. Of, there is some inherent talent, but I think absolutely it can be honed. And um, we recently together went to Cannes and spent the week at Cannes, right? I mean, I, I personally learned so much from that week, um, from hearing other people's experience, from seeing the amazing work Um, across the industry, uh, you know, how can you fail to be stretched, to be inspired, to be able to lift your own personal game after a week like that? I think, uh, you know, it, so for me, it's a combination of, yes, I do think some people have inherent talent in the area, but everybody needs to stretch and build their capability. I, I agree so much. In, in my book, I, I make an analogy with sports. I mean, you may be born an amazing yes. and talented soccer player, tennis player, but if you don't train, no. you're not going to be able to leverage your potential. Yeah. While eventually, if you're average and you train, probably you're not going to become uh, Djokovic or Maradona, yeah. but you can still play, you know, at the competitive Absolutely. level. In, And, and training so is so, so important in all of this. Um, you, you mentioned Cannes. Yeah. Uh, we were a few months ago in Cannes together. And, and there were a lot of conversations mm. and a lot of content around purpose mm. and sustainability. And it was wonderful to witness, wonderful to see. Uh, I have a few questions about that. The first one is... How important is purpose and sustainability in marketing today compared to a few years ago? And why, eventually, if it is important, is becoming so important? Look, I think marketing essentially is a fundamental shaper of culture. Okay. And the reality is, you know, 20 years ago, um, sustainability wasn't top of mind for consumers, it wasn't very on the radar. I remember maybe first conversation started, but it was really a, you know, a newspaper article, maybe an odd production film. Now, I think there is a collective consciousness amongst you know, billions of people in the world that actually we are in a climate, uh, not just climate change, but we're in a climate emergency. And we as a generation have a short window of time where we can change the trajectory of the world forever or really commit the next generations to a very, very difficult future. And so I think the collective consciousness that we have to act and we have to up our game um, as a society is, is absolutely growing and grown enormously. And because marketing innovation has a role in shaping culture, in, in reflecting culture, in, 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 I think, pushing forward culture in some ways, 
I think it's very high on the creative industry's mind. And actually, it needs to be, right? Because the world needs creativity. The world needs um, those with the most resources, those that impact the most people's lives to step up to the game and use all of our creativity, all of our innovation, all of our storytelling abilities to capture the imagination, but most important, capture action that's going to make a difference to the world. And so I, I think the time is now. I don't think the industry, you know, um, always gets it right. Um, you know, one of the themes at can was um, let's stop falling in love with the problem. You know, our job is not to advertise the problem. Our job is to fundamentally innovate and act to create solutions. Creative I solutions love, that make love a this point. I want to. I want to emphasize this point that you're yeah. about to, that you're making and <laughs> add some color to this. T tell us yeah. more because this is so important. In, yeah. Instead of advertising the problem, let's advertise a solution to that problem. Yeah. Awareness versus action, right? Awareness you need awareness, obviously, but you need action as well. Absolutely. Look, I think you know. Um, as I said you know, rather than uh, um, advertising the problem, you know, raising awareness of the issue. Um, actually, I think it's brands and companies' jobs to find coalitions, find partnerships, and find big creative ideas that can together solve the world's, some of the world's most difficult challenges. And actually at Can, I was reminded um, years ago, back in, I think it's 2019 now, we, you know, we as an industry came together and formed the Global Alliance for Responsible Media. That's a coalition like no other in the industry to fight harmful content on social media. It's a coalition of, of you know, um, advertisers like PepsiCo. It's a coalition of uh, media and agency groups. And it's also a coalition of the social media platforms. And that's a coalition and a collaboration of action that is seeking to come to groundbreaking industry standards to help move forward the action to attack harmful content. So, for example, it's about creating common standards on harmful content. It's about creating common third-party verification. That creates traction at an industry level, which creates a movement of change. And is it perfect? No. Is it progress? Yes. Um, uh, so that's one example. Another example would be, um, actually, Barrow, you and I taught this when we first met. I was telling you about the Sheba Hope campaign. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a wonderful <laughs> one. It's so inspiring. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, I was super proud of the team at Mars, you know, who who won two Grand Prix and, uh, and another Lion, I think, uh, uh, can for that activation. But, you know, what the consumer sees and acts upon is this amazingly creative uh, vision of Hope Reef. Hope Reef is a reef that's been built in Indonesia uh, off the coast of Sulawesi. And it literally spells the word hope. And you, it's so big, you can see it from space. That's the wow moment that gets your attention, right? For, for the people listening to us, Google it because Google you can it. find it online and it's just... Amazing. It looks like done in Photoshop, but it's real. It's, it's real. real. It's real. And that's the point. That's what grabs the attention. But the action behind it is what I'm super proud of that team for. You know, actually, the, the bold commitment is 10 years of commitment to improve and restore, help restore ocean health through coral reef rebuilding. And in fact, the team have plans to create hope spots all over the world with very tangible commitments on how much reef they're going to actively rebuild. And all supported um, through a, a sort of a, a also sustainably sourced fish program, which guarantees sort of 100% sustainably fish, sustainable fish across the portfolio. And, and, and that particular activation is done with the Sheba cat brand. And, you know, it's backed up with innovation, but also uh, moments of acts, I would say, acts for the consumer where they can get involved in restoring ocean health, either by supporting sustainably sourced fish products or uh, by really acting and sharing what they want to contribute um, to coral reef restoration. And for me, that big creative idea, which is quite simply growing hope, you know, we are not hopeless. The ocean health, we depend, millions of people depend on ocean health. And whilst 
we're in real difficult times. That you know ecosystem is really under pressure. We are not hopeless. We can act. We can begin to make a difference. And I think we all need to. And, and I love that as a symbol of, uh, as a, lit- a literal symbol of growing hope. Yeah, that's one I well, I, 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 I I love the campaign and you know this well. Okay. I, I also love what you just said, this idea of hope that we have in the world. And both you and I had this wonderful journey in multinational yes. corporations. And I think this is what the opportunity that these companies give us, the opportunity of reaching billions of people. Absolutely. And if you have the right purpose and the right approach, you can really change the trajectory of many things happening in the world. I mean, this is the beauty of working in these big companies when they listen to you. I I mean, you mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why you joined PepsiCo is positive and and this commitment of the company to purpose and sustainability. And so if the companies give you the platform to act, then you can really have an impact at scale. And this is beautiful, Mm -hmm. I think. No, absolutely. Look, I, you know, I was um, extremely impressed with PepsiCo's commitment to pet positive. So just to give a little flavor on that, I don't know how many of you listening, I'm sure many of you are very deeply committed to sustainability. But one of the things that really came through for me with PepsiCo's commitments was the stretch, the approach, the scientific approach to picking goals, which is really our fair share of solving for the problem. So, for example, our commitment to get to net zero uh, by 2040, lots of companies have uh, uh, committed to that on scope one or scope two, which is sort of direct operations. But, you know, PepsiCo's commitment goes right through the agriculture chain, right through the value chain to the crops where, you know, we grow, uh, to the farmers that we work with, to the millions of farmers whose livelihood depends on PepsiCo. So that's a very, very bold goal and a bold set of actions. I think the opportunity, as I see it, is exactly what you said. We reach billions of consumers every day. So whilst the company, PepsiCo, has all these amazing commitments and actions to make a difference, and, you know, I've seen uh, since joining just how much commitment there is and dedication to making progress. This isn't a, you know, a goal we'll review in 10 years' time. I can tell you we're looking at it every period, every quarter in terms of are we on track um, to make that difference? But our goal as innovators and and marketeers is how do we involve the consumer in that? Because they want it. You know, they, they, they want to buy brands for whom they understand the values. They understand, uh, uh, what those brands are doing for the world. So our job is to connect what we're doing corporately in a meaningful and authentic way where it matters to our brands. And just give, uh, you know, one example of, I suppose, my excitement to use the fact that we do reach billions of consumers every day to make a difference. So we've launched, for example, our pet packaging in many markets in the world on the Pepsi brand. Um, You know, and if you think about Pepsi's power to reach billions of consumers, it's incredible. And I'm super, you know, proud of the Pepsi team who have used their brand power, their incredible sponsorship partnerships with people like the NFL to really start the conversation and start driving action amongst consumers to educate on recycling, to try to really create that closed loop circular economy by not only providing our pet packaging, but actually encouraging and ensuring the consumer actually recycles it and it goes back into the system to create that beautiful uh, circular economy. Um, and the way they did it is they used their NFL stars to uh, with a big campaign called Trash Talk, which made it yeah. fun and cool and, you know, raised awareness, but also raised advocacy of what it means to recycle. I think, you know, we as marketeers, we as innovators, as a creative industry, you know, we have to use the power of design, the power of storytelling to drive those actions because, uh, yeah, the world, the world needs it. You mentioned an example that is really, really relevant and very important yeah. right now in the conversation that is going on in the business community, the marketing community, in the creative community in general. We heard it at Cannes. There is a lot of conversation around purpose and sustainability. Yes. And a lot of people in the hallways in Cannes or at the parties, at the, <laughs> at the cocktails hours. Did you go to any like, of those, Mauro? I, I saw you in, the, <laughs> in work mode the whole time. <laughs> 
we were working in those kind of um, <laughs> situations. And, uh, you know, people talking about, yes, okay, this purpose and sustainability, but come on. I mean, people also want to have light content and they yeah. want to have fun and they have so many problems and now inflation and wars and uh, pandemic <laughs> and... Yeah. <sighs> Can we also have some light content? And so yeah. I was reflecting on that. And the reality is that there is a way to have fun and lightness in connection to purpose and sustainability and in general, deeper mm -hmm. meaning and deeper contents. Uh, and that's probably the challenge of the marketing and design community, how to do it, how to inspire people even in a light way, but with a profound meaning and, yeah. and content. What, what's your point of view on this? You mentioned just an example from Pepsi that was actually trying yeah. to do that. So what, what's Look, your point I, of view on I, that? I absolutely have learned uh, many times over that you should play in the rules authentically of your category. You know, at PepsiCo, we have amazing beverages brands. We also have amazing snack brands like Lay's, Doritos, Cheetos. You know, you have to be authentic to your brand and our categories are fun. Let's not apologize for it. We bring fun. We bring joy. We bring smiles, billions of smiles. And that's a strength we should never leave behind. So I absolutely believe, you know, sustainability, diversity, inclusion doesn't need to be sad, doesn't need to be uh, uh, stressful and anxious. And I believe we, we will make much more progress uh, by finding the authentic way to find that, that, that magic. Um, sweet spot. And actually, I learned um, many years ago, um, a Mars actually on Pedigree, uh, Pedigree Feed the Good campaign. For years, um, the brand was really dedicated to adoption, driving dog adoption across the world. And we have many creative platforms um, that advertised the problem really and, and were sad, left you feeling that they, they did get your attention, but they didn't necessarily get your action. Um, it was actually when we used humor and used empathy and insight. And actually there's a great campaign called Child Replacement Program, which is a fantastic innovation um, from the Colenso team, the New Zealand team, uh, uh, who really actually made it fun. They, they used the insight that um, empty nesters actually suddenly feel very alone at home, right, when their kids leave. And uh, the whole thought was, this is a child replacement program. Uh, and it used a lot of humor to basically say, forget the kid who's left, adopt a dog. <laughs> uh, and they showed all this very humorous uh, comparisons of, uh, um, you know, sentimental, nostalgic pictures with your children. And then sort of, you know, for example, compared it directly uh, with, with how you feel when you have a dog. And it was a brilliantly humorous way of opening up a whole set of future pet parents to adopting and made people much more willing actually and able to adopt and much more engaged in the campaign. So that's just one example where I absolutely believe humor and joy is often a much better route um, to open action, but it needs to be authentic. I, I, I love the fact that in another context, you mentioned again, this idea of build awareness, but then there is a call to action yes. once again. So this is another example as well yes. and build awareness in an authentic way within the cultural context of your brand, your yes. category, your industry. Uh, I, I, I love the approach. Yes. Now, I told you yeah. earlier that I had multiple questions, you know, from, yes. from your introduction, that were sure. inspired by your okay. introduction. So uh, you were talking about your journey and it was very clear that you have been um, diversifying your experience. You know, you mentioned that you work even in finance and obviously in different categories, industries and companies and, and roles. How important it is diversifying your experience in your journey? You know, um, as leaders, often we try to figure out how to grow people, how to mentor people. And obviously we need to make available to them a series of tools and platforms and trainings and everything. But I profoundly believe in that drive that each of us has, you know, in that insane curiosity, insatiable curiosity 
to learn new things and learn from others and diversify your experience. So how important has been this diversification of experience in your journey to become who yeah, you are today? Yeah, it's an interesting one, actually. Um, in a way, I think you need to go broad and deep on something. Completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually don't believe in sort of generalists in a way anymore because I think the world is too complex. No one can master everything. But so do I believe in curiosity and learning from different, uh, lots of different paradigms? Absolutely. But do I believe you need to decide what you're going to be famous for, decide what you're going to really make a very substantial and bold impact on? and go deep, deep, deep and create that 10,000 ex hours of experience. Yes. So it's a combination of the two. And actually something that re related to that, one of the things, um, you know, you asked me how I got where I was today. In my latter career, in every role I've done, and, I, I, you know, I, I ended my career at Mars being the pet nutrition CMO, but also the lead CMO for the company. In my last three career moves at Mars, each of which was longer than five years in length, um, I could never see, obviously, what was the next role for me. It didn't necessarily exist. It certainly didn't exist in the way that actually it became an opportunity for me. And, and I, think, I think, you know, one of the things I've learned is you kind of, of course, you have to uh, 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 create your own opportunities sometimes. And how you do that is impact. And I'm a big believer, actually, in time and role and stretching your development and stretching your curiosity, not by hopping jobs necessarily or by going to lots of different companies, but by really stretching the experience you've got. So when I started off learning about digital commerce or e-com, for example, you know, my only experience was in Europe. Imagine the world of insight and opportunity that opened to me when I had the opportunity to deep dive. Actually, what does that mean in a, in a context of China? What does it mean, uh, you know, with partners like Alibaba uh, rather than just Amazon? It's, you know, a whole world of curiosity and a whole world of, I suppose, added experience comes from that. So, yes, I think it's really important to be curious and to go broad, but you also have to decide, you know, what's the one or two things that you're going to make a bold impact on? I, I I agree. And in general, in your journey, and then also the beginning, there are many designers listening to us um, today. Uh, over the years, I've been working with many universities of design. And at a certain point, it became clear that hyper-specialization in design was somehow a problem when you arrive to leadership roles, because you need to have a very holistic approach. These so that, yeah. products and brands today are on stage 24 seven across different dimensions. So you need to be good in industrial design, in brand design, in digital, in all yes. these dimensions. So a lot of schools started to create this curriculum of design management, mm -hmm. design strategy, where they were preparing you holistically, mm -hmm. you know, very broadly. And the problem is that these people <laughs> finished their universities, then they wouldn't find a job mm. because they were not specialized. So even at the beginning of your journey, you need to get to these companies and you need to have the unique, deep, profound value yes. that you bring to that company. You need to yes. be the best industrial designer, the best graphic designer, the best at something. Then you broaden up from there. On top of it, so this is a value and asset that you bring to the company. On top of it, anyway, by specializing one dimension, it is somehow what you are saying, but now translated yes. in the world of design, and they're very similar. You learn in that journey. You know, yes. if you spend yes. five years being an industrial designer, working in a specific category, you learn. If you spend a couple of years, first, you don't learn enough. Second, probably you're not helping the company in the best possible way yeah. because you're already thinking, okay, when I'm, when I'm going to be next. Yeah. And this is, I think, one of the biggest problems of many companies out mm. there, having people that instead of thinking, instead of having a dream of changing somehow a category, adding value to people, changing the world, it depends on what you do, but really driven by something that needs to reach people and have an impact in their life, they're thinking, okay, this is my performance review for the year. These are my goals. I need to reach those goals. I mean, how many times a goal set by somebody 
But I was thinking, okay, I need to deliver them so I can be in peace in this company and go on. But these are my goals. This is really what that's I want to do. And if you do, point. you add value to yourself, you add value yes. to your company. You, yeah. you were saying something. No, Jane, so. I so relate to that. I think I always say to people, look, you know, when you think about your impact for the year or whatever your, you call it, your personal development plan, your objectives, there are certain things you just got to deliver as part of the job. But that's your job description. That's not the difference you can make. <laughs> that's doing the basics. You also have to decide, and each of us, I think, has the opportunity to decide where you can make the biggest difference. What's your dream? Where do you want to? Actually, it may not even be on your job description. In fact, the one time I religiously followed my job description was when the one time I almost got fired until I realized, <laughs> actually, you know, I, I, I put such value in the job description of a role I was given because um, it had taken a long time to align many leaders that I really respected and inputted to it. But actually, it was kind of a, a um, an impossible mission. And until I ripped it up and decided, <laughs> of course, there were some basics to deliver, but until I was able to articulate my dream of where the value I could most add to the company in this role was, then my team uh, started to flourish. And, and I, think, I think, look, that obviously changes as you go up in an organization. But um, I had this amazing leadership um, coach at one time called Peter Block. If you haven't read his, his book, he's incredible. And I had this two-day leadership session with him where he was coaching us. And one of the things he, he asked us to all think about is, you know, what's your dream? What's the biggest difference you're going to make in the next three years? And we all had to present. And I remember, you know, he looked at me and he said, is that it? Is that all? Is that all someone of your capability is going to bring? No, take it higher, take it higher. And we got in this half an hour kind of, you know, backwards and forwards of taking it, make it bigger, make it bolder, make it higher. And I will never forget that experience. And I try to remind myself to do that to myself sometimes, you know, when I think, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm like, no, you know, what, what, that's not enough. That's not enough. You know, how can we stretch ourselves? How can we stretch our teams? you know, to make the biggest difference uh, possible. I think... I, I love this so much <laughs> because, look, often we limit ourselves by limiting our dreams. And the reality is that thinking bigger often is not that more difficult than thinking smaller. Yes. I mean, the action associated to that kind of thinking they're not more complex or more difficult. It's just a different kind of mindset. Yes. And often we don't have that kind of mindset and therefore we don't drive a difference, but driving that difference with that kind of big mindset wouldn't be that complicated. But no, many people don't that, think in that way. Well, and I think this is where, you know, personal development and I always think, I always try and keep two things in mind. You know, it's our job to bring the future backwards and the outside in. If you have those two lenses and you're constantly trying to think future back rather than you know from where we are what's the next step the, the problem is if you if you only ever think in that way you know we do make progress but it's incremental progress I, I think actually um, what we have to do is future back outside in and then work out what's the first step towards that future and then often it relates in 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 older progress. Um, that's something, you know, I, 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 try, I, I have to pull myself back on track with that sometimes and, and realize I've become too internally focused. I've become too, uh, you know, um, incremental in the moves. Um, but that, that's something that I definitely love to um, stretch my teams, but also then stretch me on um, so that we can make the biggest difference together. I, I, lo I love that in, um, in my book, you know, I mentioned my book because it helped me over the years thinking about, you know, a variety of yeah. different truths and then yes. translating them in stories. I, I make a metaphor or an analogy um, with the, the world of architecture. They ask you to build a building, a house or a building. There is uh, Gaudi that creates Casa Batlo, or, you know, you think about the Guggenheim and there are architects that have a dream. And they defeat the logics of physics and they create things that are like unbelievable. There are others that are like, okay, these are the rules. These are the frameworks and they're going to build, you know, the same houses with the same mold over and over again. You need to start with a dream. Then you go back. I, I love how you're, you're talking about future and then you, you take it back to today. Yes. 
And you use an analytical approach to get Absolutely. there. But you need to start with that intuition, with that dream, with that vision, yeah. and then you go back. And often that's the other challenge. There are mm-hmm. amazing dreamers that are that have a very difficult time in having a more analytical approach yes. to arrive to that dream. Yes. And others that instead, they're just very analytical and then they lack the ability to dream. So dream, yeah. dream, dream, dream. Dream, dream. There and actually, is, you said yeah, something very ahead. important there because I often use the the analogy of architecture, actually, um, to illustrate the science and the art of growth because, you know, even Gaudi does use the law of physics. Right? The yeah. laws of physics, so there are certain elements of architecture that, you know, if you don't comply to the laws of physics, your bridge won't, you know, last time, last time, right? Um, however, it's the creativity that you add on top, which kind of just redefines what's possible. And, and that's what I love. And that's what I love about, you know, using the analogy of architecture, because someone like Gaudi, you know, he had this vision of the Sagrada Familia, for example, in Barcelona, this amazing cathedral-like structure, like none other in the world, organic forms, etc. cetera. Um, he painted the vision for it, but he also created the blueprint on how to get there. So he had the bold dream, but he also created the blueprint on what it would take to build it, compliant with the laws of physics. Um, and what I love is even post him, his, his own death, you know, I think he's died for, uh, you know, at least 60, 70 years now, you know, people are still implementing his blueprint to bring to life that legacy. I mean, what a wonderful thing to leave the world. People so inspired by the direction that they take it on. It doesn't need the individual to make it happen. You know, that, I, that, that's, I, that's leadership. On I, a, love, another I mean, level. I have goofballs uh, <laughs> as you tell the story, because look, at the end of the day, especially at a certain point in our life yeah. when you know, we arrive to a certain age. <laughs> Which point is that, Mara? I'm not sure. <laughs> it, it actually changes by people. But, you know, in, in our, uh, you know, th- there are these three steps that we follow to search for our happiness. And the first one is, is about ourselves, our realization often is through our jobs and what we do. It doesn't need to be the job, but is what we do. The second one is this exchange with people close to you, family, friends, the love you give and the love you receive. The third dimension, and again, often for many of us come later in life, is the thing that is bigger than us. Mm. It's a dream, once again. It's a vision that you have. Yes. It's something that you want to leave behind you even when you're gone. And it could be in different dimensions. Mm. For, for instance, in, in my specific case, this idea of building a design capability in these multinational corporations that will survive me, yes. but even when I will be gone from this planet, you know, that's that's one of my dreams. And, and, and you were talking ex- exactly about this. This is a way that we have as human beings to defeat death, to become immortal, immortal in the memory of people, inspiring people, leaving something behind that people will think about. And going back to your coach, uh, I think this is exactly, you know, one of the key ingredients of those dreams of the thinking big. What is something so big that will be a legacy that you will leave behind to the next generations, to the planet, to the world? And, And again, when you work in a corporation, of the size of Pepsi, of Mars, of these kind of companies, you have the ability, the resources, the reach to actually have that kind of impact. And that's really magic. Yeah. No, I, that's, that's a lovely way to think about it. My, my dad, who um, uh, is a big hero in my life, um, you know, he was in education and his big dream was to make a difference um, to education for all, comprehensive education, you know, in his... Um, fundamental belief was that education shouldn't be defined by privilege. It should be available and accessible to all. And, and he drove his whole life's career behind that. And, and he undoubtedly created a legacy in, in his way in that. But he also talks, and I know, I know you, because your book is incredible on this. He also talks about our most important legacy is on what we enable in others. And actually, um, you know, that people, his belief, which, which I love is that we all live on through the gifts and the interactions of, that we create in others. And, and actually I think in, in big companies and small companies, uh, you know, how you get the best out of diverse teams, how you enable people to bring their full selves to work, to believe and to know they can make a difference. And, you know, you know, and I know, I mean, I've just received your, your design book for the year from your team. 
I mean, what an incredible summary of a year's work, you know, those projects, you know, you've brought out the best in teams all over the world um, to deliver. You've created a spirit of harnessing diversity, harnessing different points of view to elevate the work. And you can see that in the work. It's incredible. Um, I, I think that's the biggest legacy um, because actually in leadership roles, it's not what we individually do. It's it's what we enable others to do. And, and I, I think that's just such a privilege, honestly. Well, you you mentioned a key word, yeah. leadership, yeah. and this is one of the questions again <laughs> inspired by the beginning of your, yeah. uh, uh, the, the, your initial story. So you arrive to where you are, and you arrive to where you are as a woman leader. By the way, you know balancing your work life, building your, a wonderful family. Yeah. Uh, to the many women listening to us, but also to the many men that are working with mm. women every day in a different capacities. Uh, do you have any message, any insights, uh, anything that you learned during this journey that could be relevant to the people listening to us today uh, about yeah, being it, a woman leader? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I, you know, I have to be totally honest. In in my first fifteen years of my career, I really resented being called a female leader. I'm not. I, I used to feel, why, why are you pointing? Why are you putting me in a box? I want to be judged on my impact, not my sex or you know. Please judge me on my impact. And um, I was quite um, against female-only groups, and I, I I wasn't against other people joining, but I was very reticent myself because I didn't want to be put in a box. I wanted to just compete on my own uh, uh, abilities. It was really. Um, I, I've been very lucky to get, be given a lot of leadership coaching and support. And I remember going on this amazing course called Leadership at the Peak, which was five days of intense coaching. It was a lot of coaching. It was a lot of feedback, <laughs> feedback from peers, from teams that reported to me, from uh, more senior players and against all sorts of leadership criteria. It was a real gift. It was an amazing feedback. And one of the things it got you to do was to identify your strengths and, uh, and also, of course, your development areas. But it was a big moment for me because I realized I'd scored myself significantly below uh, how my peers and, uh, and others had scored me. I saw this as a good thing. I saw this as humbleness. And you no, know, I, I felt actually a moment of, okay, that's, that's, I'm a nice person. That. And what I realized in that course was uh, the coaches shared with us that that's a common trait amongst female leaders. Um, yeah, of course, it's not universal, but many, many females underrate themselves versus their true impact. And actually, I really reframed for myself in that moment that it's not a good thing. It doesn't make me a nice person. It actually was stopping me being bolder, stopping me making some of the difference I could make because I was holding myself back underrating what I could do maybe. And look, I think we all, you know, uh, uh, have these moments where I actually, you know, at that moment realized I needed to be more curious about myself, but also other people's experience. And that's when I opened myself actually to female leadership groups. And I've, you know, got so many insights and, um, um, learnings, um, so many friendships that have blossomed as a result of that, where I've learned actually quite often things I'm grappling with, many others are too. Um, and, and, and I, I, you know, what I'd say is open yourselves up, be vulnerable, share authentically what, you know, your concerns are, find groups where you can authentically bring to the table, um, your full self, because the power and the, insight you get from that is incredible. And, um, you know, I could share just one insight that, that I gained from that, that female leadership group, which is the thought that for many female leaders or other underrepresented groups, we specialize in mentors. So lots of, uh, and I, I certainly was like this in my career, I had lots of mentors and mentors can be a wonderful thing. Coaches, you know, perspective, curiosity, Mentorship is fantastic. But one of the insights I gained through that group was they are fantastic, but they're not enough. You also need to develop sponsors. And the difference between a sponsor and a mentor is a sponsor is someone who has the decision authority and the will to actually put you forward for things and to sponsor you into a role. So it's not a 
act. It's not a passive support. It's a very active support. And uh, that was a real insight for me. I'd never thought about it like that. And it made me realize um, that, you know, to create the opportunities that I, I was keen to make, that was something I needed to really reflect on. So I think, you know, sharing uh, uh, amongst um, groups where you can be authentically yourself and develop your leadership, your self-awareness, your leadership offer um, is, a, is something that we all need to continuously do. Uh, that's what we call an actionable insights, mentors and sponsors. That's something that people can <laughs> practice right away. Find yeah. your sponsors. Find your sp I, I could yeah. go on, on and on and on with questions for hours. Just one last quest uh, question for a short answer. I, okay. I'm sure you could talk for one hour about this, but one of the key criteria for me, criteria number zero, not even the first, before the first, yeah. when I hire people in my team is kindness. People need to be good people, kind, hurted people. How important is kindness for you in your private life, but almost or also in your professional life when you build teams and you interact with yeah. your peers? Look, I, that's a great question. I think one thing I've learned is that um, values and the values you hold, it's really important to align with the culture Uh, uh, and I've been very lucky to work for three incredible companies, all who had really important values and cultures which aligned with my own, own set. I think as a person, if you're in dissonance with a company's values, really you should leave. Uh, you should, you know, be clear that it's not for you. Um, so the, the value of kindness, um, I always say be tough on the issue kind on the person. Uh, so I think we can't confuse kindness with not calling out the tension, et cetera, but we need to distance the two. And, um, you know, I personally absolutely value people that respect others by showing them empathy, kindness, respect, all those things, which I think are very important to human relations. And actually I, I learned most in interviewing people, interviewing for nannies, not interviewing for mm -hmm. team members. T and tell me about that. Tell me because, yeah, yeah. as you know, I have a little baby, <laughs> have a little baby. <laughs> and I'm doing exactly that right now. <laughs> well, so here's, here's the story. So I remember, you know, my precious, my precious Will, who's now 17 and just going off into the world, doing work experience this week. So it's another world. But I remember the terror I felt in, you know, handing over his care to someone I, I didn't know. And I remember I went through a series of videos where I'd done all my due diligence on questions, you know, and they were all logical questions of tell me a time, you know, tell me a time where, you know, uh, you have, you know, experienced, um, you know, I don't know, the child's in danger somehow. What did you do? Have you had first aid training, et cetera? All this logical questions. And of course, anyone that's done any research on what it takes to be at nanny can answer all those logical questions. The thing that differentiated the candidate was when I went off script and said, tell me about yourself. What's important to you? Tell me about your family. What, you know, what, what do you value most? What does a great day look for you? What does, you know, and you get much more into a values-based conversation. That was what helped me really decide Um, uh, the nannies that we chose. And we've been incredibly blessed. Our last uh, nanny is still with us, despite my children being 17 and 14, because we can't bear to, bear to part. She's a, like, a, she's part of our family and, and she's incredible. Thank you, Regina. Uh, uh, she's at home today um, and she's an incredible part of our family. And why that's worked is because she shares our values. She's incredibly kind, as you say but also purposeful person um, has made an incredible difference to, to our lives. So, I, you know, as I say, that was a, a real lesson to me and always connect with someone on their, on their values. It tells you a lot about whether you can really work together, I think. Well, Jane, thanks so much for sharing your Thank experience, you. your insights. Uh, you welcome once again to PepsiCo now it's been a you. few months. Uh, we can already see and feel the impact and I cannot wait to see what an even bigger impact, your dreams, the dreams you were talking about earlier will make in this company is going to be a pleasure to be part of the journey with you. Well, I'm thrilled. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, thank you, Mauro, <laughs> for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.